Let's pray. Father, thank you. Would you not only anoint what we say, but would you anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit would say to us from the lesson. Father, infuse us with something that will change us into your image. That we leave here, Father, with a cry in our heart, not just to know you, but to know your body properly, and properly relieved. We ask in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let me turn on this up. Okay. Hopefully. All right. We're going into lesson eight, and we're still in the bloodstream. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's on, on my uh, YouTube channel, Dr. William J. Hurst Ministries, YouTube. YouTube. Yep. Just get her to look up YouTube and then put your name in it. Yeah, Min and put ministries on the end of my name. Look at the last page. The last page will... It has it on the last page. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Let me read that first page again. And the reason I did that is be, I'm going to do that is because when I go back and go back too far, it erases what I've done. Okay. Plasma is a yellowish fluid in which the cells or corpuscles are suspended along with other small particles. It's made up of a solution formed of a base of water having in it salts and proteins, especially the salts are interesting. The tissue fluid that bathes all of the body's cells circulates in the lymphatic system, and the cerebral spinal fluid in the cavities of the central nervous system are all similar in their composition. Let me say this. Fluid, what was it Star Trek used to say? One of the, the aliens said, all you guys are 90% water. You're just a bag of water. Well, we're not water, we're salt water. All right. <laughs> the fluids contained within the eyeballs and the inner ear are applied with it as well. The main difference being the presence of red blood corpuscles and plasma proteins. Now, consider this verse because it's going to set a context for us. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, He'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now remember that he said, he send the Holy Spirit, he will abide with us. But that's only one-third of the Godhead. There are conditions that increase the presence of God in our life. And one of them is, if a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, Father, Son, and now we have the Holy Spirit came, we have the Father and the Son coming and making his abode with us. We can have the full abiding of the Godhead in us. Some people are happy with the Holy Spirit, and hey, that's wonderful, but they, the full Godhead wants to come and dwell in us. Right. You want to put pick up the microphone, dear, oh, oh, and turn it on. So the folks online that we are happy to have with us can hear. Okay. Condition to think about Jesus, about Father, the Father up on the throne up there, you know. Um, cause I get all this mail from all these people wanting money, you know, <laughs> ministries and all that. And I was holding them up to the Lord, you know, saying, now, now, Lord, what do you think about this one, you know? I was like, you know, he's not, yeah, I can call it down here. <laughs> I've got to keep right. myself. You know, he's right here. I don't have to hold the way up there. <laughs> but it's just, you know, habit. You just think about right. You know. And and we were brought up that way. 
Anybody that went through the religious system at any level was brought up to think that God's up there, he's waiting for everything else to settle out, and then he'll come. But this says in John, says we will come. Father and Son, Holy Spirit's already here. Father and Son will come make our abode. Will come, he will come unto us and make our, his dwelling place in us. It is the keeping of his words that causes both the Father and the Son to come and make their abode with us. In the plasma composition, 90% is water. What's water a type of? The Word. The Word. 1% is salt, 7 or 8% insoluble proteins, and the remaining 1% or 2% is a variety of small organic molecules, sugars, fats, amino acids, hormones, and vitamins. The 1% salt is representative of a covenant relationship. When they give you an IV, they don't give you just water. They give you salt water. And that's because the salt in the spirit, so, there's the salt of the covenant from Leviticus 2 and 15. And he said, every sacrifice must be salted by fire. And he calls it the salt of the covenant. And so God is trying, what does salt do? It purifies, what else does it do? It makes you thirsty, but it also keeps the water in. When I worked at a hospital back in my early days, I mean my early, early days, I worked in stores, and stores was right near the furnace room. So we were, the stores room was hot, and they would give us salt pills because we sweat so much. That's to keep the salt, or keep the water in. There is, it's essential that we have covenant relationship which will help keep the word in us. One of the factors to remember is that he set his word above his name. Now what do we do in his name? In my name you shall heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. But his word is above his name. That's so important for us to catch because sometimes we act like his name is everything. But if it isn't according to his word, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how logical it may seem, even spiritually logical, if it isn't according to his word, we need to at the very least put it on the shelf until full revelation comes or set it totally aside. In this case, it represents the word because it is fluid and 90% water, representing the spirit word. That spirit word contains proteins, hormones, sugars, fats, and vitamins. They are essential to feeding the body and give it energy and life. So as we talk about the, the natural blood and realize how vital it is, how more, much more important is the blood in the body of Christ? It is the word that flows. The problem with many today is they're stuck in a certain portion of the word, and it's almost like a blood clot. It stops up the life of God within them and the flow of the Spirit. The plasma. The fact is that it is in a salt or saline solution adds weight to the need for the word of the spirit to be salted by fire. Folks, if we're going to grow, we're going to go through fire. Don't look so happy. But there are those out there who rebuke the fire, rebuke the dealings of God, and don't grow because they're rebuking the very thing that will set them free, that will give them life. And Jesus said, for everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, 
But if the salt has lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves. Begin to let God build covenant relationships in the body of Christ. Listen, we can go and visit many places, but God wants us to have a base. Okay? And when we wander about, we actually cannot... Um, we cannot do, we will not grow to the greatest extent we can, and we cannot help others grow. You know, Peter, or uh, is it Peter or Jude that talks about clouds without water? What does that mean? That means they're in the realm of the spirit, but they carry no substance. Okay? God wants us to be clouds with water. He wants us to have substance. Many of God's people want the word dwelling in them, but are unwilling to allow it to be salted with fire or tested by fire. You know, I was reading uh, the book of Revelation one time, and I said, wait a minute, Lord. The woman in Revelation, the one, the harlot, has, is clothed with gold. Isn't she? I said, and, and you told us in, in chapter 3, verse 20, I counsel thee to buy of me gold. But they're both covered with gold. What's the difference? He said, the gold of, the, of Babylon, Mother Babylon, has not been tried by fire. we we'll just leave that one there and move right on. The different substances within the plasma represent the substances God uses to feed each cell, bringing it nourishment. There are spiritual parallels that could apply, but we do not have time to go into the, those at any depth at this point. In some of the later courses, I begin to go into some of that. Our purpose in this study is to open the eyes to deeper truths concerning the body of Christ from a basic understanding of the basic principles certain parallels allude to. So, part of the body's defense system are small cells known as platelets. Now catch this. When a vein or artery is cut, platelets rush to the site. They swell into odd, irregular shapes, growing sticky clotting the cut, and which creates a plug. When the cut is larger than they can handle, they initiate signals that call for help to begin the clotting. Tiny vessels in our circulation system catch this. Rupture hundreds of times each day. If it wasn't for the platelets, we'd bleed out. The nature of the platelets can make Ne the necessary repairs. What do the platelets in the natural body represent spiritually? In Isaiah 58 and 12, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the fountain foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called a repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to flow in, I mean dwell in. The work the platelets do clearly fits the job description in that passage. If the rupture is not repaired, the blood leaks into places causing harm. Now remember, the blood, where's the life? So when I bleed, I'm losing life. The body of Christ is weak and sickly because it's bleeding and there's no one there to catch, to stop it. And we're going to talk about that some today. If in the local assembly and the universal body of Christ there's no ministry to repair broken relationships or paths of communication between brethren, then there's a loss of life in the body. The life in a local assembly escapes the presence of God within it diminishes and there's a loss of members and spiritual life when there's a breach in the spirit of a man or woman or an assembly. See, we don't think in, you know, 
We've just been through a catastrophic event where life was lost, where the blood flowed out. I believe God has been working to, to bring the, the clotting, and, but now it's time for repair. Okay? And it's important that we pray into this repair job because we want God to rebuild the flow of life in the body. The plug formation by the platelets, by the way, look at this little uh, movie up here in the right-hand corner. Can you see that? There's the damage. So look what's happening. They begin to clot. These are platelets producing a clot so that the repair job can be done. The plug formation by the platelets lets the foundation for lay the foundation for a clot, which occurs only after the platelets have sealed the break. What application can we give this? Paul in the letter to Corinthians, points this type to this type indirectly. For 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by, manifesta by manifestation of the truth, not by speaking the truth, although we need to do that. We need to say, Lord, show me how to manifest the truth. By manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Our God is a reconciler. So Isaiah 58 and 12. To understand the word breach scripturally, we need to look at a few instances. In Numbers 14:34, God defines a breach of promise that originates from him and the reason for the breach. See, we've left all this stuff in the Old Testament, not realizing it has a New Testament application and an application in the body of Christ and in our assemblies. Numbers 14.34, after the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Their disobedience produced a breach that lasted 40 years. In other words, there was a hole in the spiritual wall. Okay? In this instance, it's a gap between the giving of the promise and the fulfillment of it. The reason the gap of time is there is because of Israel's sin and iniquity in relationship to believing God's word. You know, we're only going to have as much power as we have that faith reaching out and believing what God has said in spite of circumstances. Joshua and Caleb believed God in spite of the circumstances and it gave them longevity so that not only, not only did they, did they live the, four, the, the 40 years, but they became the leaders of of the next move of God, which was a move of warfare, not wandering. Folk, I was sitting with uh, Tracy this morning. We talked about the season of warfare that we're in. There has been a ramping up of the enemy trying to take people out, trying to bring down uh, assemblies that God has called. There's been a ramping up of that. We need to realize it. We are at war. Okay? And we need to get the strategy from God, number one, to war for our own situations, but also to war for God's pur purpose for this assembly, for this land, 
and for what he wants to do. God has something he wants to do that has not been done before. When he said, behold, I do a new thing, he wasn't saying, I'm going to do it sovereignly. He was saying, I want to do it through a people. Okay? In the spiritual body, there are breaches in our relationship with God. God wants to raise up men and women who know how to help us mend those breaches. There can also be rifts in relationship with other members of the body. God has made provision for that as well. So here's an example. In, in Psalm 106, verse 21, they forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him where? In the breach. I look for a man to stand in the gap. The, the condition of Israel shows us what the breach was. Moses shows what it means to stand in the gap. Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Here we have God wanting to destroy Israel. The breach was made by Israel for getting God. This incurred God's wrath. Moses, in his attitude and with his life, broke the breach that had been made, turning away the destruction by inserting himself in the breach. God show us how to insert ourselves in the breach. One man stood before God for over two million people. God is looking for men and women today who will insert themselves. Moses said, if you don't take them up, blot my name out of the book of life. I can't even comprehend that. Because I don't want my name to go out of the book of life. But Moses' love for the people and his stand for God's word and God's promise. Because later on he said, they'll say that you can bring them out, but you can't bring them in. God has made some promises, and between bringing them out and bringing them in, there's some stuff to go through. We're going to go into detail on some of that, because it's, it really is important. God's speaking through the prophet Ezekiel in 2230, and I sought for what? One man to stand in the gap. Moses is an illustration of one man standing in the gap. So is Daniel. One man prayed, and over 600,000 were released to go back to Jerusalem. We do not recognize the power of one man's prayer. It wasn't just a now I lay me down to sleep prayer either. It was an intense confession with Daniel. He confessed the sins, and he not only confessed the sins, but he held up to God his promises. You said after 70 years you would. Time's up, God. <laughs> yes, Tom. Uh, mentioning something about prayer. It says the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Mm -hmm. So does did you interpret that as being if you're standing in prayer for somebody or for others and you live your life a certain way that your prayers are reflected by the way you live or something? It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you look at that word fervent, it means red hot. It's a passionate prayer. It's an identification prayer. And if you read Daniel's prayer emotionally, or Ezra's prayer, or Nehemiah's prayer emotionally, you will see that, that they're pregnant with emotion. Okay? And that's important for us to see and understand. 
They, yeah, Daniel, who God said, if Dan, Daniel was alive when God said in Ezekiel, if Samuel, uh, what was it, Noah, Samuel, and Daniel were alive, were standing before me, they'd only save themselves by their righteousness. God called Daniel righteous while he was still alive. Yeah, he was a good guy. <laughs> All right. And then look, look at what happened to Jonah. Yeah, he got in the wheel of a problem. All right. I sought for a man to stand among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Now, here's something I want to say. I'm rarely political. This is not a political statement, but there are thousands praying and standing in the gap for America. And we need to honor that power and that prayer and pray into those what those are, folks are doing. If we're not, if we don't feel called to intercession, we need to honor the intercessors because they are going to keep judgment from coming to America. Now, I didn't say they're going to keep chastisement from coming to America, but the judgment issue. By the way, people call stuff judgment that isn't judgment. I know when uh, Katrina came, you know, down there on the coast, and people say, oh, it's a judgment of God. No, it's not. Look at the judgment of God in the Word. It's a lot more intense than Katrina was. And everyone knew in the Word, each time everyone knew it was God. Even in the book of Revelation, when the plagues come, it says, and they repented not, and they called out against God. They knew where it came from. I believe in the last days the judgment is going to be such that there's no other way this stuff could happen. It's going to be that clear. Otherwise, why would they curse God? Why would they refuse to repent? They know Somehow, that opportunity is presented. By the way, most of us in bringing, hearing about coming up about that time, we thought we we're going to be out of here. And they wouldn't even be able to get saved except they kill. No, it says they repented not. They were given opportunity. Okay? But we won't go into Revelation tonight. God is looking for men and women who will insert themselves in the rupture in the walls of salvation. The walls of salvation are like the walls of the blood vessels in the body. A further study of the breach in Scripture would show us the different places there can be breaches, both literally and through spiritual interpretation or parallels. In 2 Kings 12, 5 through 14, there's an incident of the restoration under King Josiah. In this instant, the breaches were in the temple of God. Folks, when God talks about the temple, he's talking about two things. It can happen in your temple because the temple of Solomon is a type and shadow. It's the only temple that, that the scripture gives us the full description of. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So these things can happen in us, but also in the temple of the corporate body of Christ. He said, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Corporately. God wants to do a work corporately as well to cleanse his temple. And they, those breaches were in the temple of God. They had not been repaired. Because of this, the worship in Israel could not be properly conducted. God is correcting things even in worship today. When there are things that are not in order, that order, the order that God has ordained for our assembly, the ability of the people to worship is inhibited. God considered this to be a breach in the walls of our worship. This type of breach also speaks of the breaches or holes that can come in our personal temple by disobedience, calling to mind that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. There are parallels in the corporate temple that we are as well. God began to show us the parallels so that we begin to find the breaches 
and we begin to see God heal the breaches and the intercessors are willing to stand in the breach until the repair is made. Yes. Use the mic, please. Uh, it says when things are not in order, what does that actually mean? Does that mean sin or things are just not running the way he wants it to? Or what? I, I've come to the conclusion that every assembly, every group, God has, a, has an order that's unique to that place. Okay. And when we get, when we find that order and adjust to that order, it releases more of the power of God. Later on, we'll talk about the spine. And the numbers in the spine are all governmental numbers. You know, the gatherings of, of vertebrae. And when there is a disc out of place, what happens? There's a, a pain. Why? Pinch nerve. Oh, you mean th that the ministry is inhibiting people's relationship with God? Huh? Oh, yeah. See, the, the, we haven't studied the natural body, so we don't realize our responsibility is ministry. My responsibility as a minister is to keep it possible for you to hear from God for yourself. And to protect that right. And in the past, the ministry has inserted itself between you and God. And because of that, there's been the body has not been able to function. They've limped along, you know, or there's been pain. And we haven't recognized it because we don't know the natural. Okay? At this juncture in the study, I want to show us what is probably the most likely area in which a breach can occur in our spirit. The following verse is a clear reference concerning that occurrence. Proverbs 15.4, a wholesome tongue, the Amplified says, with its healing power. You want to turn that off, Jan, please? Yep. Okay. A wholesome tongue with its healing power is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is what? Not a breach in the soul, a breach in the spirit. That's quite a statement, isn't it? No, it's, it's, it's not prevented. Well, let, let's go on because we define perverseness here. Our temple can have a breach through which foxes, spirits, can enter when our tongue twists the truth to our advantage, which the Bible calls perverseness. If I try and make the scripture say something that exalts me and not him, that's perverseness. And it is a breach in my spirit, not in my soul. The root of the word perverseness is perverse or pervert. To pervert means to twist or adjust. There are many areas in which we can pervert words, acts, truth, and each of these can cause a breach in our spirit. By the way, God is beginning to bring a soberness in the body of Christ. Now that doesn't mean we can't have fun. It means we begin to consider the word of God a serious matter not just something to help us along and make us feel good. When it says breach in our spirit, it is speaking of the innermost part of our being. The enemy of our souls is always on the watch for these breaches. They are access points for him into our lives. That's why we need spiritual platelets or intercessors. The Apostle James indicates that he that does not offend in word is what? A perfect man. Indicating by this statement that the most likely point of offense and sinning is where? Word. We could say that most of the breaches in our spirit are made as we go, as we do not guard our mouths. In 1 Chronicles 15:12, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites, 
Sanctify yourself, both ye and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. Now, folks, the due order is not a, a method. It's not a ritual. It's an attitude, an attitude of heart. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. That's an attitude of heart that God is wanting to produce, wanting a people to produce. God can draw me, but if I don't respond, So explanation of the breach. Israel had not had the ark around for 80 years. They had a form of godliness for 80 years denying the power because the holiest of all was empty. So they couldn't take the blood in and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. It had not been the center of their life. Those who knew the law by heart had probably died. Yet God did not allow for their ignorance because they had the law of Moses to reference. They had the written law. This should cause us to walk carefully before God. God had to catch David's attention by others' death. That disobedience of the law was considered a breach. Now, folks, how do I explain this? I believe that whenever I touch, wrongly touch the ark of God and his presence, death issues. The problem is I don't look dead. It's not like us. He drops dead right there. But there's death. Whenever I grieve the Holy Spirit, there is a death, a measure of death ministered. We need to cry out, God, keep us to a place where we give the Holy Spirit preeminence in our meetings because the Holy Spirit will set the, the atmosphere for Jesus and the Father to come. The whole Godhead wants to be involved in our gatherings. He wants to come to awesome presence and show us some things that we need to see and change us because when he... All right. Uh, God had set an order of approach. i got to find out why that does that. God had set an order of approach. Not coming in the prescribed way was considered a breach. Seek God for the order he desires in our corporate expression of approach to him. It's not just individual approach. It's the corporate approach. I enter his gates with and his courts with okay. That's the normal approach. There are times when he may order differently, but that's the normal approach. And that's progressive. Thanksgiving gathers people's minds and hearts together. Praise is when there begins to be a unity, and the unity releases the anointing. Without unity, the anointing will at the very least be weak. Okay, Sometimes it may not even be there. I've walked into meetings and there was no anointing on the worship. And I said, God, I'm speaking. You better do something. And he would come and I, I would bring the anointing. Sometimes I'd pick up my accordion and sing and bring the anointing. Okay? But we've got to come to a place where our hearts are ready before we get here. The order for a given assembly may not be like any other. See, we, what's happened with our denominational settings is we have solidified the approach to God. And although, you know, oh, well, we're Pentecostal. We don't do it. Oh, yeah? You have your three songs. You have your offering. You have your... No, no. We need to let the whole... I remember we had a women's convention in, in Pennsylvania. And the worship we got some worshipers from uh, Rochester, New York. And they said, now, how long do you want us to worship? I said, till you're done. 
They said, what? I said, the Holy Spirit knows when the people are ready. We've got to give him time. They had never, they had done num numerous conventions. They'd never had anyone say that to them. Listen, folks, if he doesn't come, we're just playing church. He needs to come and we need to invite him and honor him. God is looking for men and women who will lay down their lives to do this. It's a call to be platelets in the body of Christ in our sisters. In Nehemiah's day, in the days of Nehemiah, we find walls that had been turned to rubble. They were to be repaired and all the breaches filled in. That's a type and shadow of the end time move of God. It's not just thousands and millions and a billion souls coming in, folks. God is going to restore his walls of salvation and his gates of praise. They will be a protection for the body of Christ. If we don't, well, let me put it this way. If we don't enter into worship, will we be protected? Will there be gates? Will there be things that will stop the enemy from coming in? If we don't rebuild the walls of the salvation, not just initial salvation, but the whole concept of whole salvation, spirit, soul, and body. God is wanting to restore that and show us what that means and grow up a people that will be able to communicate that to the body of Christ at large and manifest to the world that there is a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last day. God wants us to be a manifestation of that salvation. And it's more than just academic knowledge. I often say if, if academic knowledge could do it, I'd have it. But I don't have it yet. Because God is working not just in the individuals, but he's working a corporate body to manifest this thing, not just individuals. In the scriptures from 1 Corinthians, we see the clear type of the job the platelets described in spiritual reality. The ministry of intercession is vital to the continued flow of life in the body of Christ. Why? Because when there's a rupture, the intercessors are to be there, not to stay there. Okay? What's happened in the past is we've left them there, and they've died there. Because no one has come to repair the breach. Okay? One of the reasons the body of Christ is as, weak, is, as a whole is so weak, it's because of the lack of the ministry of intercession. In Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion, this is speaking of Jesus, I will divide him a portion with the great, he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgression, transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, if Jesus did that, and he's the pattern, I think there's some things God wants to awaken within the body of Christ. Jeremiah 20, 27, 18, and this, this one, when I finally found it, and God drew my attention to it, this is awesome. But if they be prophets, and if the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make what? Oh, you mean the, what, the first ministry of a prophet is intercession. Not to blab it, not to share what they feel God is saying, but to go back to the Father and intercede that which they are seeing into reality in the body of Christ. Okay? Let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and that Jerusalem go not to Babylon. In other words, folks, if we bring this into the realm of the Spirit, there are gifted men and women and men and women with gifts that are being taken by Babylon. 
They're being, they're being taken out. And the prophets were to intercede that that stop. Because they didn't intercede, much of Israel went down to Babylon. This, is, this again shows how important it is for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. In Isaiah 59 and 16, and he saw that there was no man and he wondered that there was no what? Intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. In these days, it is imperative that God raise up a people that fulfill this job description. I don't like to call it a job, but I think you understand what I'm saying. This work has to be done. Lord, raise up men and women with a burden for intercession, and they know that's their call, and give themselves to it. The draining of power from the body of Christ must stop. The depletion of life in the body is because too many of God's people are satisfied to have their own lives at as a center. The birthing of the platelets or intercessors. Platelets are made in the bone marrow, yet there is a distinct, they are distinctly separate entities from the red blood cells. Remember we talked about the red blood cells being made in the bone marrow as well? But listen to this. Their origin was traced to a giant cell called a Megalocar, or whatever he is. <laughs> Can you pronounce that one? Megakaryocyte? Okay, megakaryocyte. <laughs> Not karaoke site. <laughs> <laughs> this, there is what? A fragmentation of these large cells before they leave the bone marrow. In other words, this is a broken people. Intercessors are broken people. The fragments become platelets. These do not have a nucleus. They become storage tanks of things needed for repair. When God takes you through something and you gain substance, that is to help repair the body of Christ. During its week to 10 days in the bloodstream, it like a sponge soaks up diverse and biological compounds ready to be dispersed as needed. Jesus Christ himself said, this is my body which is what? Broken for you. He who left us the example that we should follow in his steps is the first type of a platelet. Because he is now, he ever lives to make intercession. He's standing in the gap. God gave me an illustration that really blessed me. He said, Bill, the gap between you and what I want you to be is big. But he said, as you grow, the gap gets filled up and I fill in the in-between until you get there. That's intercession. That blessed me. Because there are times when I feel like I go this way instead of this way. <laughs> <coughs> the intercessor is the next type that fits the description of the platelet. The platelet is a fragment of a larger whole that has been broken. And we can, without stretching, say that those of a broken and contrite heart or broken and contrite spirit also fit into the description of platelets. Their willingness to be broken even more makes it possible for them to stand in the breach and make up the hedge. These fragmented people, none of us like to be called fragmented, do we? I want to have it all together. Yeah, and then you forget where you put it. All right. <laughs> These fragmented people carry the manifest presence of God, according to Isaiah. The High and Holy One dwells with those who are of a broken and contrite spirit. One of the ingredients these broken ones carry that make them able to heal the wounds of the arteries and veins is the manifest presence of God. 
you know, that should really cause us to be willing to press into intercession, to become carriers of his presence. That's a vital, vital thing in the body of Christ. So we need to define revival because it's been misdefined down through the years. Isaiah 9 and 8, And now for a little space grace has been showed you from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us what? A little reviving where? Oh, you mean he doesn't wait till we're cleaned up? Thank God he doesn't wait till we're cleaned up. To give us a reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving. What is the purpose of revival? To set up the house of our God to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. So here we are, space for grace. Lord, give us space for grace. And revelation of light from God. You cannot walk on with God without revelation. Reviving in our bondage. You know, if I don't really realize I'm in bondage, can I really be revived? Extended mercy in the sight of the civil government. I believe, I honestly believe that God wants to give America, the American church four more years. In that four years, a time of favor so that we can get ready for the difficult times that are coming. Difficult times are coming. Okay? But the, we need some mercy so that the church can get ready for it. Yes. Not everyone will. Not everyone, not everyone left Babylon to come back to Jerusalem. Right. Yes. Well, that's, that's the, the thing of a president here. Biblically, Joseph had seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. The pattern is there so that if God is going to allow the judgments to come, he is going to tell the people how to prepare and get his church ready. Listen, folks. Joseph had the authority over all all the world at that time. And he dispensed food for all the world. God gave them an abundance of crops. When, when God gives us an abundance, it is not to keep to ourselves. It is for that we can feed those and minister to those who have nothing. And remember, in the end, the whole, all those in Egypt became indentured to David. Okay? Those are parallels. God is getting ready to do something in the earth. That's why also he's setting up cities of refuge, which he wants CMC to become. Will we? I hope so. I pray so. By God's grace, we will. But we need to realize he sets up cities of refuge because they're going to be needed. It's not just a nice term that we read in the Old Testament. It's a spiritual reality that God is doing today as we come to difficult times. So his extended mercy in the sight of the civil government. Revival is to set up the house of God. That's why we need four more years. So God can bring order to his church. Not necessarily to save souls. Now that, how many know that's not that's not a popular thing because everyone is out to... And, and listen, God is not willing that any should perish, but revival is not gathering in souls. Revival is vi <laughs> reing those who are already vived once. It's revival. It's, it's a reawakening. 
and the church needs to reawaken, so we'll be ready for the great gathering that's coming. Okay? Revival allows time for repairing of the desolations. There are many churches, many groups, home groups as well as ministries who have been desolate. They have been taken advantage of. They have been ruined outside of God doing something. And I believe God's going to do something in these days that is going to get a hold of the church, not just get people in, not just get sinners in, but get a hold of the church and reawaken it to what God has called it to be. Revival gives protection. A wall is a vehicle of protection. A wall in Jude and Jerusalem, the walls of salvation from Isaiah 60, verse 18. You see that title on that slide? Anointed to be a plug. Not a plug head, but a plug. <laughs> okay. The platelets build a loose plug that stops the flow of blood temporarily. This gives opportunity for the clotting to be triggered around the wound. In finding the parallel for this, we look to the intercessors to be the ones who temper underline that word temporarily. We've left them there, and they've died there. And there's never been a repair. Who temporarily close up the wound in the body of Christ. One of the mistakes that ministries have made in the past is to think that because the blood flow was stopped or the loss of the vital Christ life, the wound was either not serious or had been healed. You're an illustration. Your knee is an illustration, isn't it? What you went through. Okay? The blood wasn't leaking out, but the infection. So it had to be totally debreeded. And debreeding goes back into the healthy flesh to make sure you get all the virus and stuff out, infection out. And God is having to do that in the body of Christ, folks. Because the Christ life has been leaking out of the corporate body. The platelets or intercessors only stop the flow for a short time. This made possible the time necessary to activate the other ministries that moved to extend a more efficient block over the wound. God has ministries in the body of Christ that repair, but the immediate stopping of the flow is done by intercession. Could you give us an example of a wound in a church? We had one, okay, and we're still interceding into that because it hasn't been fully repaired. That does not mean restoring of relationships necessarily, okay, but it does mean that those that are left come together. And right now, in all honesty, folks, when we go through something like this, if we don't watch it, everybody becomes suspect. Okay? And, and we've really got to hear from God on that issue because otherwise the, the, the breach will stay there. So, you know, we, we've looked at these splits and everything and we haven't known what to do with them. In all honesty, we just let the split happen and, and try and recoup as best we can. But God wants intercessors to stand in the gap, make up the hedge, and cry out to God to release ministries that will see healing and restoration. Remember, Job said that your flesh can become fresher than a child's when we return to the days of our beginning or our youth. So there, there's a dimension there that the body of Christ has not seen. That's why you have, that's, I mean, that's why you ask the question. We've not seen it. You've been around a long time. Not quite, yeah, longer than I have. Okay. All right. A long time, yeah. <laughs> and you've seen split after split after split. Mm -hmm. And you've seen the, whatever was remained that you stayed with limp along. God wants to heal that totally. And all of these splits and cause the body of Christ to come together. He's going to have to break down those petition walls that we put up to protect ourselves. But remember, 
The wall I put up to protect myself also imprisons me. We have, we have a lot of new people, and I think they're on a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're kind of going through a time of inventory now and seeing you know, where the gifts are, where the people are, and what ministries they could have. That's true. That's true. We, we are in a, a um, vulnerable place. Okay. All right. Remember, platelets or intercessors are not a permanent fix. The wound is covered until the other members of the body can be mobilized to deal with the invasion of the foreign bodies. Without the temporary covering, there would be no ability or time to mobilize the clotting agents or the white blood cells. In the realm of the spirit, intercessors cannot do all the work necessary to either place a more permanent seal over the wound or initiate healing. They are essential in the initial attack to prevent the loss of blood or life. I think sometimes we need to begin to see that these what we've been through, okay, has really been a loss of life. The blood flow out of this assembly. We need to pray, God, do we need a blood transfusion? And Lord, we need you to repair those tears. They, they weren't just cuts. They weren't, you know, like razor blade cuts. They were tears. And a tear is difficult to heal. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. And Esther. Yeah. The clotting factors, proteins that continually circulate in the blood, remain inactive in the form of enzymes. When activated, they cause a chemical reaction that speeds up the reaction time without the enzymes being consumed. Almost reminds me of the burning bush. Burned, but was not consumed. The result is a three-step process that turns the protein into a thin fibrous thread that forms the clot. This thread is woven over the wound to form a clot. Isn't that interesting? When, when you think of something being woven, it's corporate, it's not individual. See, there's so much about the natural body that requires multiple responses. And we've got to say, God, teach me how to do this. Teach me how we can activate so that, number one, if there is a chair, immediately the intercessors are there and immediately there begins to be activated those ministries and those things that are necessary to form new, uh, to form this webbing of, or the clot over the... Um, the wound until the healing comes. The outstanding thing about this is that it is a process. Many of God's people want instant healing after a wounding. And some of them act like they've had it, but they limp along. They limp along. And it's not a limp like Jacob got that God initiated. They limp along because they don't know how to be healed corporately. I just keep thinking that we need a lot more love. That love is so healing from God. We need to seek Him for that. The the context of what's that? Well, the short answer is yes. But, but the longer answer is more difficult because, first of all, in today's world, people have trouble trusting. Okay? And because we've been through so many, uh, I mean, I've, I've been through a number of betrayals, I've been through a number of uh, 
And, and I've, I've had to recuperate. I've had to say, God, heal me. And sometimes I don't know I'm healed or whether I'm healed or not till the situation looks like the one that wounded me. Okay. And so when I recognize that I'm not as healed as I thought I was, I need to go back to Father and say, Father, heal the whole thing. Take out of me the infection of anger or whatever it is. Mistrust. Take out of me the infection so that I'm healed and I can walk into this, even though it may be look the same, but I can see you work it out different so that I'm healed. Okay? I remember one time I was going through something and I'd been through a mess before and wounded deeply. And the Lord said, I'm going to set it up so it looks almost exactly the same as what wounded you the first time. I'm going to set it up so it looks almost exactly like what wounded you the last time, but the end is going to be different. And sometimes we get into a situation, we get all, and it's because of that, uh, because of that wounding, we have all our walls up and God can't heal it. Because what is a scab? If you have a scab, is it like the rest of the skin? Or is it a hard spot? Oh. So it's not, you haven't been healed if you got a scab. The scab is there to facilitate covering while being healed. But we keep the scab. Hmm? Yeah. We pick it, yeah. We, be, we join the union and pick it. All right. Okay. God sometimes does uh, heal us, but, or, you know, it's, it's thank God for miracles. But more often than not, he follows the process he's outlined in the natural body. Often we have majored on the supernatural, causing people to expect it as a rule of thumb when it comes to healing. He often does not heal supernaturally in order to draw our attention to the phenomenal body that he's created. Your body has the ability to heal itself. And God wants the body of Christ to realize that we do have the ability if we will yield to the Spirit of God and the flow of the Spirit in us and what he's placed in the body, there is the ability to see it healed. Problem is, it's a process, and we don't like process. Okay? When God allows the natural process to take place, there's an involvement of more members of the body moving to supply what is needed. Each expression is exercised, and it's strengthened in its moving in God. When you move in God and it is confirmed that you're, you're do, it's ha happening right, healing takes place, what you are in God is strengthened. But if you're not allowed to move, if you're not allowed to exercise, then you don't grow. So sometimes, how, how many have exercised to the point of pain? How many don't exercise because of pain? Don't put up your hand. All right. <laughs> See, sometimes he allows it because we need the exercise. Who, by reason of use, have your senses exercised to discern. Okay? It is important that we let God do it his way, trusting that, God, that Father knows best what I need and how it should be administered in my life. When it, consider this. When a person remains stationary for an extended period of time, the blood flow slows. This could cause clotting agents to build up in one place, triggering the clotting mechanisms. This could and sometimes does cause problems. Okay? The spiritual comparison would be a body member who has not functioned in a long while. This non-functioning causes the life of Christ in him or her to be stopped up or blocked. 
This could be called a blood clot in the bloodstream of his or her spirit. And could be a, if it's a ministry that God's called to a place and they're not functioning, it could be a blood clot in the body, the local assembly. When foreign matter invades our bloodstream, an army is marshaled to deal with the invaders. Our next lesson will be on this army. See, and my, my thought immediately went to Joel's army, the corporate army. But there's an army marshaled in me and in my spirit man, God wants it to be healed, totally healed. He said, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved under the coming of the Lord. My spirit needs to be healed. My soul needs to be healed. I believe that as they are healed, my body is going to be healed. I desire that you prosper and be in health even as your will, mind, and emotions prosper. Your soul. So let's pray. Great physician, come and teach us how to be those who would stand in the gap. Gather together your platelets or intercessors. Cause your ministry to activate, to repair where the platelets and the intercessors step in first. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any questions? Any answers? <laughs> All right. Next week we talk about the army and the bloodstream. Yes. Manners have gone by the by in most places. They need to be retaught. The, the focus on me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, has got to stop in the body of Christ. So, yes, Tom. I couldn't help but think of Jonah when you were talking about intercessory for intercessory prayer for other people. Okay. And like, you know, you got all these people and they're all like backbiting and all kinds of horrible treating each other and all kinds of stuff. And it's like, I don't know, is there a connection there? Because I'm thinking, you know, I, you know, I have my patience tried by a lot of things and a lot of people and um, you know it makes me feel like am I like Jonah do I not want to warn do I want God to take care of him and just you know well Jonah would definitely not be a type of intercessor but he would be a type of ministry running from God and even when he said yes to God he did it with a chip on his shoulder because when God saved the people, Jonah was mad. They repented. I mean, they, they qualified to be saved, but Jonah was upset because God gave him a great revival. 600,000 people saved, and Jonah was upset. You know, but, yeah, God is going to clean up his church. Know that. I want to be on the clean side. I don't want to be on, be on the dirt cast out. Okay? Because we, we, can, we can get so focused on the, on the vile that we don't see the precious. Praising God, praising God for a long time, trying to get a breakthrough. And a cloud appeared before him, and Jesus stepped out of the cloud, and he said that he's um, bringing, because America was the only 
country that ever was started because they loved, we loved him, that he was going to save America and he was going to, I think he said, revive and have an awakening. You know, the awakening is getting people saved and the reviving is, is getting Christians saved. So, um, don't you think he's going to be um, also besides reviving the Christians, also awakening and saving more people? The, the first thing that comes is revival. Because we're going to need, uh, I often say the next move of God is the backslider coming back to God. Because we're going to need all of them to, to carry the harvest. There will be a harvest, but there first must be a, re a true revival in which more of Jesus is revealed, the, ch the breaches are filled, the walls are built, the gates are up, so there's a place where they can be safe. Yeah. Right now, there's not a, too many places where Christians, baby Christians, can feel safe. And, and you've got to educate the, the, the population within the church so that they aren't doing like what you said. Okay. Well, one of the things that we need to learn to do, if we come across someone who, you know, can't make it here, they're too far away or whatever, Holy Spirit, you said you would lead them and guide them into all truth. We brought them to Jesus. You, we release your work into their lives. Okay? Because too often we tried to do the work of the Holy Spirit. I often say I was free for 30 seconds before they handed me the real book, rule book. You know. Uh, no. Holy Spirit can do a lot more than we give him credit for. And I think we need to begin to pray into the awakening of the power of the true ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not gifts and not ministries. Those are only part of it. He's out to change our life, to make us like Jesus. And he came to reveal Jesus unto us, not just to our academic mind, but to our spirit and cause our soul to begin to be changed so that we manifest Jesus Christ in the earth. Okay?